from Florida, Mr. Gates. Uh, two how minutes. much time? Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Gentlemen's recognized for two minutes. Why are we here on the floor of the House of Representatives listening to the Democrats and socialists and their Republican puppets reviewing Steve Bannon's podcast? Can't imagine that that would be the case if they actually had a bill, a reconciliation deal, legislation to help the American people. We're not here because of democracy. Save me the alligator tears on that. These are the folks who assaulted our democracy for two years under the specter of the Russia hoax. And it's sure not about violence, because they didn't seem to give a damn when our country was being engulfed in flames during the riots in the summer of 2020. It's not about congressional process. If it was about congressional process, Democrats would be doing what they have done in other cases. They would go to court. But the reason they haven't gone to court, like they did for Trump's taxes, in the Deutsche Bank subpoenas, in the Mazars matter, or in the Don McGahn matter, is because in each of those circumstances, they did not prevail in court. The courts realized that their, their subpoenas were overly broad. So instead of using the real process, here we are just enduring this politics. And because they can't build back better, they've just decided to build back meaner. I yield back. Gates Gentlemen. is recognized. February 26, 2020, House Armed Services Committee. General Mark Milley. We know we're not going to defeat the Taliban militarily, and they're not going to defeat the government of Afghanistan militarily. You really blew that call, didn't you, General? I believe that that was a issue of strategic stalemate and that if we had remained in Afghanistan uh, with the advisory levels of effort, then the government of Afghanistan... Well, that's, that's an interesting Afghan answer to a Security question. Forces. It's just not one I asked. You spent more time with Bob Woodward on this book than you spent analyzing the very likely prospect that the Afghanistan government was going to fall immediately to the Taliban, didn't you? Not even close, Congressman. Oh, really? Because you said right after Kabul fell that no one could have anticipated the immediate fall of the Ghani government. When did you become aware that Joe Biden tried to get Ghani to lie about the conditions in Afghanistan? He did that in July. Did you know that right away? I'm not aware of what President Biden You're not aware lying, of the right? phone call that Biden had with Ghani where he said, whether it is true or not, we want you to go out there and paint a rosy picture of what's going on in Afghanistan. You're the chief military advisor to the president. You said that the Taliban was not going to defeat the government of Afghanistan militarily, which, by the way, they cut through him like a hot knife through butter. And then the president tries to get Ghani to lie. When did you become aware of that attempt? Well, there's two things there, Congressman, if, if I may. One is what I said was the situation was stalemate. And if we kept advisors with there, the government of Afghanistan and the army would have still been there. That's what I said. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But it seems wrong now. With well, the we withdrew all the, the, we withdrew all the advice. Austin. Secretary Austin, are you capable of assessing whether another has the will to fight? No, we're not. And uh, that's the point that the chairman made earlier. So. That's just like an incredibly disappointing thing for the Secretary of Defense to simply say, I can't assess whether someone has the will to fight, but it is consistent with your record. I mean, during the Obama administration, I think they gave you about $48 million to go train up some folks in Syria to go take on the Assad government, and I think your testimony was that only four or five survived first contact with the enemy. So what confidence should this committee have in you or should the country have in you when you've now confessed to us, and whether it's the swing and a miss in Afghanistan that General Milley talked to the Senate about yesterday, total failure, or whether it was your failures in Syria, you don't seem capable to look at a fighting force and determine whether or not they have the will. Well, Is recall, that an embarrassing thing? You recall, thing? Congressman, that uh, the end result was a, a, uh, uh, the SDF that we stood up that was very, very instrumental in turning the, the, the tide of, uh, of, of battle up in Syria. Oh, yeah. Tur turned it so much. You've got Assad in power in Syria. You've got the Taliban in power in Afghanistan. I mean. Where have you been? The focus was the focus was ISIS, Congressman, and we and, and those forces uh, had significant uh, effect on on the well, ISIS it, network. It just seems like you're chronically bad at this, and you have admitted that, I guess, which is to your credit. But you know, when when people in the military, like Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller, stand up and demand accountability when they say that you all screwed up, when they point out that General Milley's statement that the, Tal you know, that, that the government of Afghanistan is not going to get defeated by the Taliban, well, he ends up in the brig. And you all end up in front of us 
and your former employer Raytheon ends up with a lot of money, and we have poured cash and blood and credibility into a Ghani government that was a mirage. It fell immediately. And while the guy sitting next to you was off, you know, talking to Phil Rucker and was off doing his thing with Bob Woodward, we were buying into the big lie. The big lie that this, that this was ever going to be successful and that we could ever rely on the Afghanistan government for anything at all. You know, General Mill, you kind of gave up the game earlier when you said you wanted to address elements of your personal conduct that were in question. We're not questioning your personal conduct. We're questioning in your official capacity going and undermining the chain of command, which is obviously what you did. You, you've created this whole chain of command. Did not undermine the chain narrative. of command in any yeah, manner, did. shape, or form. You absolutely Congress. did. And it, did not. Well, you know what? You said yesterday that you weren't going to resign when senators asked you this question. And I believe that you guys probably won't resign. You seem to be very happy failing up over there. But if we didn't have a president that was so addled, you all would be fired. Because that is what you deserve. You have let down the people who wear the uniform in my district and all around this country. And you're far more interested in what your perception is and how people think about you in insider Washington books than you care about winning, Gentleman's which this time group has is incapable expired. of doing. And Ms. Houlihan is recognized. From Colorado, Mr. Buck. And uh, with the chairman's permission, I defer to uh, Mr. Gates from Florida. Mr. Gates is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is my favorite subcommittee in my half decade in Congress, and in no small part because of the way you've led it. I am incredibly proud of the work we have done to address some of these anti-competitive practices of these monopolistic entities. And I was particularly persuaded by the testimony of Mr. Gross regarding how that market power of big businesses like Amazon can limit the ability of workers to have any type of meaningful negotiation. Um, Congresswoman Jayapal led legislation that the chairman of the committee, the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Buck and myself supported that would force the breakup of companies like Amazon into smaller entities. And I wanted Mr. Gross's perspective on that. Do you believe, as a negotiator, that would improve the position of workers to break up companies like Amazon and other big tech companies into smaller entities? Um, well, I'm, I'm not an expert on this field. You know, obviously, I'm just. Uh, a driver at UPS and the shop steward for my union. Um, but what I would say, though, is that it might not necessarily be necessary to break up the size of the company, but just to allow or force the company or encourage the company to employ the workers that it's utilizing. So instead of using third-party individuals and leaning on them and chewing them up and spitting them out, have real employees, you know, give them real wages, um, allow them to have a collective bargaining unit agreement. And I think that way you would get more productivity out of them in the long run and still be able to run a successful business. I, I appreciate that perspective. My concern is that if they're able to stay so big, even if we forced, even if we used the awesome powers of the federal government to force these relationships out of independent contractor relationships into employment relationships, they're still so big that they could reduce the contributions of those employees with the strength that they have. And, and, and it is one of the reasons why we had bipartisan support on this committee for those bills. But Mr. Chairman, I'm deeply disappointed that those bills haven't been called up for a vote. It seems a bit odd to be here talking about positive impacts of legislation the subcommittee has passed when the full House has had the opportunity in prior weeks to take up these bills and they haven't. And, and I have to wonder why that has, has happened. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a piece from the New York Times entitled, Tech Giants Fearful of Proposals to Curb Them Blitz Washington with Lobbying. Without objection. And, and so that could be a reason, the power of lobbyists in this town to make things tougher for workers. I guess there could be other reasons, too. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would seek to enter into the record uh, a piece from Yahoo News entitled, Tim Cook reportedly called Pelosi to deliver a warning about Congress's antitrust bills. Without objection. So maybe it's the lobbyists, maybe it's the power of these very uh, powerful CEOs making personal calls, but, but it could even be something more sinister, 
Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a Fortune.com piece entitled Nancy, or Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband cashed in on big tech just as Congress was set to pounce. Without objection. And in that article, there's discussion of the spouse of the Speaker of the House making a $6 million call on stocks that netted $5.3 million while we're not moving these bills. So I thought that was a little odd. I thought that was weird. We moved bipartisan legislation out of this subcommittee, and just as we're considering it, and it might be bad for big tech, the speaker's spouse goes and buys all this big tech stock, and then lo and behold, here we are with the bills not called up. And it just makes you wonder, did somebody know something? Was somebody acting on information? And it could have been the power of the lobbyists and all the money that they donate to members of Congress on both sides. It could have been people like Tim Cook calling. But here's what we know. These bills aren't coming to the floor. If they were coming to the floor, they, they would have been on the floor in, in prior weeks. And so now we sit here with this great work likely extinguished in its tracks for one of these unfortunate reasons. And Mr. Chairman, I, I know we've got Chairman Nadler's Moore Act coming up soon. And one thing we learned in the marijuana movement is sometimes you got to lose votes on the floor. Sometimes you got to put up the votes, you got to lose, and then year after year, you make a little progress, you get further down the road. And even if these tech bills can't pass, I would encourage you to talk to the speaker and put them up for the vo a vote. And, and I know she said she won't put up, put up votes that don't pass, but if it could, at least give us a measuring tool to be able to come back and work to persuade our other members. I thank the chairman for his indulgence for going over yeah. time, and I yield back. And I, I want to reassure the gentleman that uh, I am working very closely with the ranking member of the subcommittee to be sure uh, that our colleagues who have not had the benefit of the 16-month study that we conducted, where we, I think, learned a lot about this marketplace, understood what these complicated bills do. We want to be sure that our colleagues are fully briefed up and we are committed to making certain these bills come to the floor, not just for a vote, but for a vote that prevails because of the hard work that's been done. And we are grateful for your ongoing and strong support. But this is an important priority for me. I know for all the Democrats uh, in our caucus and certainly for the chair of the full Judiciary Committee and working very closely with Mr. Buck to be sure we get to that point. Um, and thank you again for your support of our investigation and the legislation. And with that, I now go to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Jones, for five minutes. Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very concerned about the influence of lobbyists in Washington, D.C. There's no prohibition against the Department of Justice hiring lobbyists to be prosecutors, is there? You mean former lobbyists, I hope. Yes, you mean. that's correct. Oh, no, there's no prohibition. And can you describe for us the specific vetting that the department does when professional influence peddlers are hired and given prosecuting authorities? Well, the uh, hiring of uh, assistant U.S. attorneys is a, this is a career hire made in the different U.S. attorney's offices. There's I mean for the Washington. I mean in Washington at DOJ, are there any special procedures that There's vet lobbying contracts or maybe who a lobbyist worked for before they're giving, given prosecutorial authority? So again, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, kind of person you're speaking with. If you're talking about uh, pro line prosecutors, there is a background check. Everybody, uh, I'm sure here is familiar with the SF-86, has to be filled out, includes all the people that you worked for. The same is true in Maine Justice. But there's no yep. special review for lobbyists as opposed to people who've been engineers or had any other career? I don't know, but I, I don't believe there's a difference, but obviously lobbying may Let's ask about conflicts. political consultants. Political consultants are people who get paid to ensure that a candidate wins or loses an election, that a political movement is successful or unsuccessful. Is there any prohibition against hiring political consultants as prosecutors at the department? Again, I don't think that um, we're allowed to even look at people's politics. The question- no, 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 it's not their politics. It's the profession of being a political consultant. There's no special vetting for that. I don't think that there? there's a specific prohibition. There is a requirement that once somebody becomes a prosecutor, just like when somebody becomes a judge, that they get rid of whatever preconceptions they had before and that they go forward under their new responsibilities and are subject to the ethics rules of their new We would hope that would be the case, Mr. Attorney General, but I tend to think that if people are in the influence peddling game or they're prosecutors, 
It can be kind of dangerous to mix those, to be an influence peddler for hire one day, to be a prosecutor the next, maybe to rotate back and forth among those careers. And it sounds like there's no special vetting for lobbyists or political consultants. Let me ask the question about partisan committee staff. We have partisan committee staff that you see here. Their job is to ensure that one party or another preserves or uh, you know, uh, captures the majority that legislative proposals are successful or not successful. No prohibition against the department hiring partisan committee staff as prosecutors, is there? As I understand it, every administration, including the one preceding this one, has hired people who have been committee staff. Yeah. I don't think there's a statutory limitation. If uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate think that uh, uh, partisan, um, or I'm not sure what That's how Preparara got his job. He worked for Schumer, and then he ended up in the Southern District. So we have people who can be lobbyists and then prosecutors. We have people who can be political consultants and then prosecutors. We have people who can be partisan committee staff and then prosecutors. The public integrity section has jurisdiction over election integrity, correct? Uh, it has uh, 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 jurisdiction over election crimes, yes. Yes. So uh, is there any prohibition against people who've been lobbyists, um, partisan committee staff, or political consultants actually going in and serving in the public integrity section? Or is that allowed? I'll just say again, uh, the hiring in the public integrity section is a career hire uh, made under the civil service. It's not made. I know, I'm worried about their prior career, though. See, what, what I think is that if, if someone has been a, a political operative, to then put them in charge of election crimes, it's kind of like having the fox guard the hen house, don't you think? Oh, if, if you think that, that would be a perfect uh, example of something the House should pass a statute barring people from particular professions from working in the Justice Department. I, and would you support that legislation? I'd have to look at what it is, and I have to look at whether it, it itself violates the First Amendment, but I don't I, I think there have ever been any restrictions like that before. I, I appreciate your open-mindedness, uh, and, and I hope that persists during your time at the Department. Would you provide the committee a list of lobbyists, former lobbyists, or just former political consultants who work in the public integrity section so that we might inform on the legislation that you've suggested we might consider? Well, I don't intend to create a list of career officials and what their previous jobs were. So, so if there are people who, are, who literally were political operatives who have prosecuting authority in the area that oversees elections, you won't give us the list. I don't have any and idea whether there is the any such person. I mean, the gentleman has expired.